and you're watching Interface here on SABC3. My name is Tembi Samakhel. A wife has to leave her job to take care of a sick husband. A little girl has to drop out of school to take care of her siblings. And elsewhere, a little boy has to stay home to herd the kettle and also to look after the household. All of these people are working hard, but for no pay. Across the world, millions of people are doing unpaid work, mainly being household chores and also caring for others. But what exactly is unpaid work? Let's take a look at this report by Ginosi Queen. 64-year-old Veronica Williams provides 24-hour frail care for her aged husband. She says although she's happy to nurse him back to health, her inability to work has had serious impact on their survival. Williams used to work at a local crash earning 2,000 rand a month, which supplemented their old age grant. It also made a big difference in their pocket. But when her husband landed in ICU last year, she had no choice but to quit. Not being able to afford a caregiver meant she had to stay at home and do it herself, forfeiting extra income. I have to stay here until I make lunch, make supper. I can't leave him alone. He can't cook. I'm scared he's going to burn at the stove. So I have to be here all the time with him. William says his wife's help is invaluable. At this time and age, it's very difficult to be able to do everything for yourself, especially where you're not in good health. Had she been employed formally as a junior nurse or caregiver, she could be earning between 2,000 and 6,000 rand monthly. Mayor Veronica is just one of 5 million South Africans, mostly women, involved in unpaid work. There are no statistics to account for unpaid work, but experts say the economy would be adversely affected without the supportive work. There are several categories of unpaid work. Um, basically, uh, unpaid work often involves young people uh, who work on a volunteer basis in order to gain some work experience. Um, they used to work on apprenticeships at very low pay, but now the phenomenon of voluntary work has emerged. There are also people within the household who do work on an unpaid basis. Uh, they could either be homemakers or uh, um, domestically involved in the household. Um, they don't receive remuneration, but their work is certainly valuable. I think if we included their contribution in our official estimates, uh, we'd see they make a big contribution to the economy. The United Nations Development Fund for Women, Unifirm, says unpaid care work is a major contributing factor to gender inequality and poverty. Gender analysts say local government structures should ensure that water and energy is made available, especially in rural areas. This will free up time for women and enable them to participate in the formal economy. But labor analysts say it will be difficult to measure unpaid work in rand value. Normally when we measure the contribution of a worker, we look at what it costs to hire them. Uh, and that is some measure of their productivity, it's some measure of their uh, contribution to society. Um, but with unpaid work it's very difficult because there's no income involved. Uh, so what you would have to do is probably measure the income that someone could earn in an alternative application and count that as uh, income. Uh, or uh, some kind of income. Government has devised policies and laws that ensure gender equality, but South Africa's caregiving culture, which is traditionally regarded as a woman's role, will continue to relegate women to the lowest ranks of the economic ladder. Genosi Quine Interface. Well, thank you very much, Genosi, for that report. Let me introduce you to our guests at the moment. Kubi Rama is the Chief of Operations at Gender Links, and also in uh, Cape Town studios, we're joined by Dick Forsland, who is a researcher and an economist at the Alternative Information and Development Center. Remember that you can also join us in this discussion by sending your comments to our Facebook page, which is Interface on SABC3, or also sending us an SMS to 33726. Welcome to both my guests. Kubi, let me start with you. We heard about the care economy. Uh, in that package and how this affects women in particular. Why is it that we are finding so many women caught up in this unpaid work? 
I think there's several reasons, but let's start with some of the major ones. We are hardest hit by the HIV and AIDS pandemic mm -hmm. in this region, and South Africa, Lesotho, Swaziland, countries like that have very high levels of HIV AIDS prevalence. As a result of which, there's a lot more people requiring care. And the state health system, as we know, does not cope with the level of care that is required. So a lot of that care is happening in the home and in communities. And what we're starting to see is a culture of volunteerism. Mm. Now, the problem with that is that this is real work. These are people working, doing work that really the state should be doing. But they're not remunerated at all. And there aren't proper policies in place for the remuneration of those people. Mm. So th these are essential services. But how do you explain a nine-year-old girl that we read about in the papers this past week that was pulled out of school by her mother to take care of her siblings? You understand on the one hand that the situation at home requires somebody to be there because the mother was working long hours somewhere else. But how do we then say this child should be remunerated in any sense? I don't think it's necessarily about remuneration. I think in a situation like that, it, and it's becoming more commonplace, yeah. where girls particularly are being pulled out of school in order to look after siblings, you know, child aided households are on the increase. Mm. I think the issue that it needs to be addressed at a policy level and, and at a nationwide level, a government action level. So we need to start looking at this. You know, if there's a nine year old looking after a household of other people, the state needs to step in and say that nine-year-old should be in school. Mm. So what's the quid pro quo? What support can the family get then so that she can go to school? Dick, let's get your thoughts on this. We heard Loan Sharp in that package saying that you can't really quantify in monetary terms what uh, this unpaid work contributes to the economy. But what can you tell us about what we are losing from the economy when these people have to leave their work and go and take care of their sick loved ones? Yeah, I think we are lose, we're losing a lot. Uh, it would be economically much better if uh, this was taken care of collectively, so to speak, if it was taken care of by the public sector. And this goes for child care, it goes for care for sick and for elderly. A lot of it should be the public sector work. And what about volunteers and, and other people that do holiday work? Surely there are other aspects of unpaid work. It's not just those people that are taking care of other people. No. Uh, well, volunteer work is, is good. There's a lot of, of unpaid work in the economy. So f fetching water, fetching firewood, uh, uh, yeah, different kind of cooking, cleaning, making the laundry. And, and so on, and most of it is performed by women and girls. Um, so yeah, there's a lot. It not it's caretaking work is one aspect of uh, unpaid work in the classical sense, but then you have a lot of other activities which is also unpaid. But are we not burdening the state? Could be you mentioned that government needs to step in, like for example, in the case of that nine-year-old girl. But are we not overburdening a fiscus that is already? too stretched when we're saying government should step in? Should we not be looking at corporates, for example, to say, look, if you have a staff member that has to go and take care of a sick loved one, you should then remunerate that person? I think when I say government, I'm talking about a systemic solution. Okay. So not, not just government as an institution, but all of the institutions that operate in our society. So for example, General Links did a study a few years ago called Glass Ceilings, Women and Men in Southern Africa Media where we found that in top and senior management positions in South Africa, for example, uh, less than 25% of women were present. So women hit the glass ceiling very quickly. And one of the reasons when we interviewed women in the media industry mm. was because they got pregnant, because they had to be mothers. Uh, you can't prejudice women because they're going to be mothers. If they're not going to do it, who else is? Mm. So, th so yes, you're right. The policies and practices within institutions that, you know, public institutions and private institutions need to start to change. For example, how many media entities have creches? How many businesses in South Africa have, have creches? creches? Period. So it's a, it's a very important mind shift mm. that productivity is not just about having women in, you, you know, you, people don't have to be present. We live in a world that's online now. It's a virtual world. You can do your work off-site uh, and still be effective. 
All right, after the break, I want us to talk a little bit about the new growth path and how this whole thing fits into that. And also, solutions. How do we then move forward on, on this thing and make sure that everybody plays their role in making sure that this unpaid work issue is dealt with? Stay with us. Welcome back to Interface. My guest tonight as we talk about unpaid work, Kubirama, who is the Chief of Operations at Gender Links, and also from IK Town Studios, Dick Forsland, who is a researcher and an economist at the Alternative Information and Development Center. Dick, before the break, we we're talking about the burden on the fiscus, and you wanted to make a contribution particularly to the tax issue. Yeah, I mean, there's a myth uh, going around that the tax pressure in South Africa is very high. And uh, that is completely untrue. It has no support in, in data if you go to tax statistics. But the tax burden on, I yeah, if you look at the tax burden on individuals, both of the individuals and corporations since 1994 has decreased immensely. But Dick, uh, if, it's, if it's you look at just the basics, as a taxpayer myself, if you look at pay as you earn, you look at the fuel tax that we pay, you look at every other little bit of tax that we pay, surely there is a, a case for that. Well, I mean, you have a tax to tax income to GDP of 25 percent in South Africa, that is lower than United States. And, and as you know, United States, the establishment of the United States is very much against taxation. So, mm -hmm. if you would have the same tax pressure on individuals on only the personal income tax in South Africa, it would, if it would be in the same range as it was in 94, 95, 1996 the fiscus would get over 100 billion rands more every year. And of course, that would ma make an immense difference when it comes to, to finance and to redistribute uh, uh, this unpaid work from being private family work to public work. Actually, I want to so, get your so thoughts just, on... Just, I want to get your thoughts on how this can be done. Critically. Sorry, we have a slight delay on the line, but I want to I want to get your thoughts on how that can be done to make sure that government then uses the tax base to to take care of unpaid work. But Kubi, you, you wanted to say something there. No, I was, I was listening to what Dick was saying, and I was trying to understand, you know, how that would necessarily work, because I think uh, when we talk about taxes, etc., we're talking about a particular segment of the population. Yes. And really what we need is a holistic solution. One of the problems, for example, with the NGP is it makes no reference to the informal sector economy. And we don't quantify that. And there are so many women in that sector. So how is that, is that sector now going to fit into this new growth path? And I think the constant uh, absence of the informal sector, unpaid work, and quantifying the work that we do in our homes, etc., uh, it, it leads us to a point where the, whatever economic strategy we've put in place, we leave people behind constantly. How should they be reflected, Dick, in, in, in this whole structure uh, of the new growth the, path and also the Vision 2030? I think it should be reflected if the government wants to reduce uh, unpaid work and support women and girls in the community, the government should be very restrained in all these gigantic projects and instead uh, put effort to build up piped water, uh, local roads, uh, solar energy and so on, the uh, because would argue, th the that would reduce. The government would argue that that's exactly what they're doing at the moment and that that is well, part I've, of the new I've just been, I've just been around the roads in, in Pondoland on the east coast, so I know that uh, too little has been done. <laughs> I mean, look at all the social protests all over the country. You have 16, 16 uh, local social protests against bad so service delivery, no sanitation, no piped water, bad roads, and so on. So it, uh, effectively, it's, it seems obvious to the many communities that the government is not doing enough. And if you are going to reduce the, women, the unpaid work by women and children, women and, and, and the girls, then you have to make more social investments, small-scale investments in the communities and not these grand-scale high, highway toll roads and so on. Okay, I fair think that point. would be a, 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 good, a good way to go. Fair point, Kubi. That would Kubi, reduce unpaid work. Right. If, 
if, if we were to take what uh, Dick is saying and, and try and implement it, but if you look at the economic and the, the cluster of ministers that would have to be involved in making sure that what Dick is saying actually happens, a lot of them are males. What are the practicalities, in your view, that would make this happen? Do you think we have a chance uh, that those males can actually have policies that are pro-women and pro-girls? I don't think it's necessarily just about who makes those decisions. Yes, of course, you need women represented, represented at all levels of decision making. Uh, you know, the uh, SADC protocol on gender and development says by 2015, we should have 50% of women in all levels of decision making. Clearly, we're not yet at that point. But it's also an ethos. Um, it's about saying, okay, we've got Vision 2030 and we've got the NGP. What are the key drivers? What is it we're trying to achieve? And I think what Dick is saying is true on some levels, that service delivery, you know, one of the things that wastes people time is the fact that they've got to fetch water, they've got to fetch wood. Now, in Botswana, for example, they do time use surveys where they ask people, how much of time are you spending doing that? In addition, they also ask people in Botswana, how much of time are you spending caring for someone else who's ill? Now, you can quantify those things. And for me, the important thing is, as soon as we start to quantify it, mm. we're then able to see how we should address it. Because you also then see where it's happening. So it would have been good if our census had done that, for example. We haven't had a time use survey in South Africa, I think in, uh, it hasn't been done for over 10 years now. I think it's very important to guide where this economy goes and macro and microeconomic policy. Okay, so both of you agree that we can actually do some things to make sure that we address this issue. But going back, Dick, to the tax issue, how would you see that playing out with the current fiscus that we have? I mean, how would you see government allocating funds to deal with this issue? I would, the, 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 the first thing the government should do, I think, is to abandon the political goal of restraining tax income to the government of only 25% of GDP. Uh, and the only thing that the government has to do, do to do that is to stop making tax breaks every year, because that is what the government has been doing, especially since year 2000. There's no sort of high political pressure on the government to keep on doing these uh, tax uh, breaks uh, every year in personal income tax. Of course, some conservative economist is howling in the media, but there's no strong uh, political pressure on the government. It could just stop doing it and sit, no, don't rock the boat. I uh, tell you, Dick, the, I the, hear the, the revenue service is bringing in new taxpayers every year to the, to the fiscus. Just don't rock the boat and the money will be coming in. Nobody I, would he, I hear a collective sigh from South Africans who are saying, how can you be saying this? And I think now. we should consider bringing you back and talking specifically about the tax issue here on Interface so we can try and get to the nitty-gritties well, of what you, you mean convince. about this. But we have to take a short break. Remember that you can take part in this discussion by sending us your comments on Facebook, Interface on SABC3, or send us an SMS to 33726. We're back right after this. Welcome back. This is the last segment of Interface here on SABC3. Our guests tonight are Kubi Rama, who is with uh, Gender Links. She's the chief of operations there. And also Dick Forsland joining us from our Cape Town studios. He's a researcher and an economist at the Alternative Information and Development Center. And we're talking about tonight, we're talking about unpaid work, particularly the care economy, those people who are taking time off work to take care of their sickly loved ones and, and other people. And remember, you can join us by uh, sending us your comments on Facebook and also sending us an SMS on 33726. Kubi, just wrapping it up now in terms of the way forward, we've spoken about uh, some of the things that government can do, and you've said it is a holistic approach that we need to take. Let's break that down, that holistic approach. I mean, what would uh, the community in general need to do? What would business need to do? What would government need to do in coming to the party here? I think the first thing I would have to say is overall, we need to move from policy and legislation to implementation at all levels. And then the other thing is that this is really about gender inequality mm. because so much of this unpaid work is visited upon women because there's an assumption 
women are caring, women are the carers, and we should carry that burden of care. And I think that needs to change. So at community level, I think we need to start talking about the shared burden of care. Mm. And I think it impacts on so many different things. It impacts on things like fatherhood. You know, women shouldn't just be parents. And it's important for us to have responsible fathers. So I think at a community level, we need to start talking about this burden of care and how we share it, e equitable ways of sharing it. I think within businesses, it's certainly important for businesses to know and understand how women's lives are different from men's lives in, yeah. in the workplace. And how do you mitigate that? How do you put in place you know, structured institutional practices so women are able to advance in their jobs and still be able to look after their homes and even within the home to start sharing that burden. I think at the level of the state, it's about thinking in a much more cohesive way about who compromises this economy, in, who comprises this economy in this country. But Kubi, let me put you on the spot on this one. We've had the new growth path coming out. Very little mention of women in that growth path and what government would do going forward. And this is the plan going forward. And yet you have organizations like Gender Links. You make a little noise here, a little noise there individually, and nothing really happens. Actually, that's not entirely true. Gender Links did a piece of work for the World Bank mm -hmm. where we did uh, put together a submission both for the new growth path as well as for Vision 2030. Uh, we did an analysis of the entire strategy identified all the gaps and then made proposals as to what should but be included. But Kubi, that's on paper. Where is that spirit of activism? Where is that spirit that says, let's challenge this thing, let the women, as they did when we burnt our bras back in, 19, in the 1950s, let's go out there and let's challenge this thing. Let's tell the government that this is not really something we're willing to accept. There's none of that happening. You, you're speaking to my soul here, Tembisa. Yeah. You know, I'm one of those ungovernable youth. <laughs> Although I wouldn't quite burn my bra anymore. No, no. I we're kind of past that these stage days. now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I certainly think you're right. I don't think it's just, it's only about women either. I think as a collective, as communities, we need to be, hold government a lot more accountable in a public way. You know, the activism, activism needs to come back. And here, you know, we also need to say to the unions, you know, how are you mobilizing us mm -hmm. in communities to challenge the government to say, look, these economic policies may not work for all South Africans. And what happens now to these women that are off taking care of their loved ones, that are not having an income coming into the home uh, because they are not working? And we are sitting here and we're talking about it, but how do we take it forward? How do we help them? How do we get to them? I think we've reached a point now in South Africa where we've got a well-established two education systems. But clearly one isn't working very well. Yeah. You know, the CETAs are not that functional, etc. So we need to start saying, you know, what are the opportunities for these women within their communities? How can we promote economic activity at community level? So that these women are not completely outside of the economy. So they look after someone who's ill and when they're no longer required to do that, they, without skills, yeah without any and how avenue. And reintegrate? Exactly. Hmm. So, you know, looking at a strategy at community level where they can stay integrated and stay in touch. And I think that's, that's probably the most difficult thing, you know, through the non-formal education sector to see how we make it real. How do we help people get those qualifications? We say they can through lifelong learning. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Let's also thank Dick Fosland from our Cape Town studios. We lost the line to him, and so we couldn't bring him in to get his final thoughts. But thank you also to you, Kuvi, for giving us your thoughts on this. And hopefully Gender Links will champion the cause in making sure that the women, especially, that are working so hard and not getting paid for what they do are actually taken care of at community level. But thank you so much for joining us. And that's how we come to the end of tonight's program. Thank you so much for all of your contributions, and thank you to my guests. Remember that we can continue this conversation. Interface on SABC3, that's how you find us on Facebook. And also, if you want to send us an email, interface on SABC3 at sabc3.co.za. From me, Tembi Samachele, and the team, good night.